Hello, everyone, and happy Monday. We're so excited to have you here today with us. Welcome to our webinar, Leveraging the Science of Reading to Boost by Literacy. My name is Laura Almazara, and I work on the literacy team here at Amplify. We're so excited to have you here with us. And before we get started, we have a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, today's webinar will be recorded, and we'll email out the recording link for you to rewatch as you'd like, share with colleagues, that sort of thing, later in the week. And everyone here with us today will also receive a certificate of attendance. We have a live captioner with us today, so if you want to access the captions, just click on live transcript in the bottom tray. And throughout the webinar, we welcome conversation and questions. Um, if you have any comments about anything you're hearing, please share that in the chat. And any questions, please throw in the Q&A, and we will get to those questions at the end if we have time. To start, we'd love to hear where you're coming from today and what your role in education is. Laura, we actually can't hear you. Yeah, I was going to say, OK, I thought it was me. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, and she's not muted. So yeah, hold on. Yeah, I can't hear. Can you? So you can hear me. I can hear you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's. Um, yeah. Let's see. Oh, I'm last drop. Yeah. Can you hear me all right? Yes. So as as Laura, you know, it's just so wonderful. I'm looking here in the chat and and I mean, we've got representation of folks in so many wonderful roles and from all over the country. I, I was tickled to see someone from Hawaii um, actually joining us as well. So just welcome everyone. We're so excited that you are here with us. Um, we're going to go ahead and get you started and I'm going to turn it over to Anna. Welcome, welcome. Excited to be here with you and thank you for joining us on our session, Leveraging the Science of Reading to Boost by Literacy. So excited to have you with us today. I am Ana Torres. I'm going to be one of the what we call presenters today. Really, Alessia and I are facilitators of discussion, right? We're so excited to have you here. I am a biliteracy, a biliteracy specialist here at Amplify. I have been an educator for 25 years, half of that time in the higher education space and the rest of that time in K-12. to And so um, bringing you lots of knowledge and expertise. And so we're happy to be here with you. And I'll let Alessia introduce herself as well. Thank you, Anna. Hi, everyone. My name is Alestra Menendez. Um, I am from California. I'm actually a former dual immersion in teacher in California in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is where I am from. And um, I've also been a curriculum developer at uh, UC Berkeley's Lawrence Hall of Science. And now I am a biliteracy specialist here at Amplify with Anna, and we are both so happy to be with you. So thank you for joining. So we are going to talk about biliteracy. Who is ready to talk about biliteracy? I know that Anna and I sure are excited to be here. We have been so looking forward to this discussion that we're going to have with you folks today. Um, one thing we wanted to ask you to be um, kind of thinking about is, you know, when you hear this word biliteracy, um, what does that mean to you? And why is that important to talk about? Um, as you know, we're thinking about developing students' literacy and language. Um, feel free to, you know, to kind of just sort of shout out to us, you know, kind of what kind of things when we say that word by literacy, what comes to mind? So 
I see some 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 really great um, notes here. Okay, so transfer skills, dual language, reading, writing, speaking, listening in both languages, bridging, oh, multiple cultures and languages, translanguaging, um, special education. Thank you for that. Access to standards for all, each and every student. Um, reading in multiple languages, multilingual learner, shifting power dynamics. Oh my goodness, proficiency in more than one language, capacity of reading, um, being able to write and read in two languages, just all of these things we are we are so resonating with. And so what we'd like to do right now, folks, is um, introduce you to some biliteracy experts uh, that we know, and you know, just keep it coming. All of these ideas are so wonderful. And I hope that you know, by seeing what your peers here on this call are saying, you're also getting as pumped up as Anna and I are. So let's go ahead and meet our biliteracy experts. Let's meet them because they're, it seems like they're ready, right, to talk about biliteracy, Alestra. So let's meet our true biliteracy experts. Bilingualism is an asset. Bilingualism is a cognitive strength. El conocimiento de un segundo idioma. Viene de la construcción del primer idioma. Foundational skills, vocabulary, and knowledge are important. Todos se transfieren a otro idioma a través de instrucciones explícitas. Our language development is critical. Universal screening in Spanish and English is necessary. Debemos honrar el idioma del hogar. La cultura y las experiencias comunitaria de los estudiantes. Wasn't it awesome to hear from the true biliteracy experts? Let's give them a round of applause. Those are our true biliteracy experts. I just have to say, Anna, um, can you can you feel the animo? I like, do. You see all these hearts and applause, and Oops. like it's just people are going wild out there. So thank <laughs> you. We, we share your enthusiasm. So I love Sarah. Wonderful. Sarah says, "Me encanta." Me too. Whoop whoop, right? Don't you love to hear from the actual true biliteracy experts? Exactly. Thank you guys so much for the love. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. So, you know, without question, we we know that being bilingual is truly an asset. We know that, you know, these these are student experts, you know, they were echoing this. They were telling us, you know, why that is such an aspect, um, an asset. Um, and I think all of us, you know, I'm seeing all the hearts and the applause. We know that there's like social and cultural benefits, of course, to knowing more than one language. Um, but we want to talk a little bit about some research. So let's take a look at this finding. This is by Goldberg and Wagner. Bilingualism is associated with cognitive benefits. So let's look at some of the cognitive benefits um, of being, you know, bilingual or biliterate. So one of them is we have an increased control over attention. This is like executive functioning um, that is impacted by being a person who kind of navigates in two languages. Improved working memory. Now, for those of you who kind of nerd out around brain science, um, you know, I, I'm part of, of your group. <laughs> uh, you know, working memory is so key to learning. And the fact that, you know, they, Goldberg and, and Wagner have found that for bilingual folks, they actually have an improved working memory when they are navigating across two languages. So um, that's another cognitive benefit. Another one more cognitive benefit um, that was found, you know, for being bilingual is, um, and Anna, I don't know if you can go ahead and advance. Thank you. It's like a greater awareness. And I think all of us, you know, here on this call who have worked in the bilingual or biliterate space, notice this. There's a greater awareness of structure and form of language. When you're learning a second language, you're more kind of meta aware of your own language. Um, or maybe you're, you're, you're learning, you know, you're kind of simultaneously learning two languages. So you're constantly kind of doing this analysis, um, linguistic analysis. And then finally, um, there are better abstract and symbolic representation skills. You know, for students who are learning two, two languages or more, um, think about it like our multilingual learners, right? 
they they really are using their brain differently and th and this is what we know and we know there's going to be so much more research around this and i can't wait to to really learn what all those researchers are finding about you know these benefits to being multilingual so let's hear from anna you know anna's going to talk to us a little bit about you know how are we serving our emergent bilingual students so that they can develop their biliteracy thank you alestra so as Alestra mentioned, we're going to segue into looking at our, our emergent bilingual students, right? And so we know, those of you are that are on this call, you know, from what I'm seeing in chat are super passionate about this topic. So you know a lot about it. And we know that there's a growing number of emergent bilingual students in our nation's classrooms and in, in, in our schools. And we know that 15.5% of those students are in K-3 to in those grades, right? But what we also are, what's notable as well, is that as we look at this pie chart, 75% of those are Spanish speaking students. This is something to celebrate as Alessia has been mentioning here and, and our, that what research is showing is bilingualism is an asset. We have this 75% of students that are Spanish speaking, something to celebrate, something to honor, and it reinforces what Alessia pointed out prior. What's important to notice too, also what our um, bilingual experts were saying is that bilingualism is an asset and a cognitive strength. With that noted, let's take a look at what our country, like our, what are students in our classrooms? What are students in our districts? This is just kind of a, looking at these first and kindergarten students here, what are the students that we're talking about? And here's kind of just a small demographic of that. The students here on this slide, they have very unique backgrounds, heritages, language profiles and in, in, in terms of how, you know, language exposure um, in their heritage and their education thus far. You have Tessa, monolingual English, English speaker, right? Her family is, you know, from of a German descent is the monolingual English speaker. You have children like Evan coming from New York. English speaking, but also Haitian Creole, bilingual, right? You have students like Sammy and Monica, and who are, and also Eli, who are bi, I'm sorry, Sammy and Monica, who are bilingual already, Mexican heritage um, with Sammy, you have Peruvian heritage with Monica, have been in the US for a little bit of time. You also have students like Eli, who's actually, who actually knows a little English, but hasn't had full exposure to it yet. And then you have my beautiful Inez, who I relate to the most, who is a Spanish monolingual speaker. Inez resonates with me because I'm actually originally from Panama City, Panama, came here at the tender age of six and had to learn the English language without a lot of the supports that we have currently. But that's, that's, for, that's another TED Talk and another Oprah show. But as Inez resonates really um, with me as far as being that newcomer. So I show you this, this slide because many of your schools, many districts, this is what your, your, your students look like. So they live all over the country. You've got Maryland, New York, Utah, Oregon, Ohio, South Carolina, you have the entire country represented here. Here's an example of where they could be and also the models Hey, Anna, I don't mean to interrupt you, but um, you're a little spotty. Oh, I think we lost her. Alestra, do you mind taking over? Um, not at all. Um, okay. I think, you know, what, what Anna was, was just, and I'm, I'm well, she's going to come back. She's going to come back, but I'm just going to go ahead and sort of move us. So Anna, you know, she, as she was I sharing, you know, the, the different students and their different language profiles, you know, we're, we want to be thinking about how is it that we are supporting um, these these Spanish speaking students, how do we serve them? 
Um, Anna, do you want to go ahead and yeah, I'm back. I apologize okay. for that. Thank you so much. So we're looking at the ink. Well, so as I was mentioning, various and different models. One of those models is our English in program where English development is purely supported through immersion, some ESL supports through pull out or push in by a resource teacher. And as I mentioned to you, as we were looking at that, that I all of the students I, as an N fall into that category. What's another model? We also have what's called the transitional bilingual early late model, right? And how, what does that mean exactly? Where the goal is English language proficiency, but we're looking at that Spanish literacy and that language that's gonna be continued to be developed for, the, for those students until they're what we call exited out of the program. Remembering that the ultimate goal is English language proficiency, but there will still be support in that Spanish literacy. So that is students like Elon. Will be, would be in this model. And then finally, we have what's called our dual language program, which is becoming very popular, right? Our dual language model, where the ultimate goal is biliteracy and bilingualism. So we have students like Sammy and Marco and Tessa, varied um, uh, languages, as you see that like Tessa is an English speaker learning, learning Spanish, and then you have Sammy and Marco um, having proficiency in Spanish and English on very different levels. So one thing that I wanted to note that you see that Eli is kind of the lone ranger here in the transitional bilingual model in this illustration, but know that this model is very common for students in his profile, as well as Inez. Wow. This is like one of the most exciting things and we are going to be talking a lot about research and what backs all of this up. So bilingual instruction has been proven to be the most effective as we look at the emergent bilingual like this long term achievement um, model illustrated here in this graph. And so this graph what it's illustrating is research from the renowned Thomas and Collier right they've been around for decades. Um, they're internationally known for their research on long term school effectiveness for linguistically and culturally diverse students. And what this graph does is it portrays various instructional models and the outcomes of grade one, all the way to grade um, 11th grade. So as if you look at this, um, at this graph and you look at the bottom here, you look at these bottom lines, what they do is reflect what these two lines reflect are the two types of English immersion programs, your pullouts and your content English language um, development programs, where, I, where Inez, who is our newly arrived from Nicaragua, she fits in this model. Then if when you start looking at these middle lines here, so those middle lines reflect transitional bilingual instruction, that early late, that early or late exit model where Eli would fall in because Eli whose home language has been Spanish, fits into this model here, this early late exit. And then as we look at the last two lines here, right, those top lines, those represent the dual language instruction, whether it be your one way or your two way, and Gabriel and Sammy and Tessa are here. Look at the difference. So as you look at the difference, and we know that bilingualism, right, is something that is an asset, there are differences in the various models and which one is the most effective. So with that said, you can see that it's proven that knowledge in the second language builds on the first based on this graph. So, and also quoting our bilingual experts here as well, right? What it does, it supports that positive long-term outcome, but we still need to be very intentional about serving those students in the English immersion and early late exit programs as well. So although this graph and this research shows the benefits of it, as educators, we need to be very mindful that we have to be very intentional and purposeful to make sure that there's positive outcomes for all students in all of these models. So let me segue into another important thing that we were, as we were, as we're um, just having this discourse. Now I'm bringing it back to you. As we look at that, this is bilingualism is a strength. Spanish literacy is really important to know in order for 
Um, and I saw some people mention in chat too, like what biliteracy meant as far as looking at both languages, that translanguaging, and someone actually mentioned trans, you know, transferable skills. But I want you to be thinking of how your district or your school is assessing those Spanish speaking students. So there was a, re there, um, and so as you're looking at that, I want you to take a look at some of this data. So in 2019, there was a study done by the University of Oregon researchers basically done on pre-K students, native speaking, um, Spanish speaking, pre-K students, they were assessed in phonological awareness. Phonological awareness is the ability of those students to identify first sounds of spoken words. So they were given this, this assessment. So this is this shouldn't be a surprise, right? So the, when those students were assessed in English, in the look at this, webinar. can I call you back? Look at this, 63% were identified as needing tier one or tier three instruction. This number, this data doesn't surprise, shouldn't surprise any of you on this call. But what is interesting is we're misidentifying students based on how they're assessed. Because when these children, these Spanish speaking pre-K students were then assessed in their native language of Spanish, look at the dramatic, look at the significant drop in the percentage. 21% of those students, when assessed in Spanish, right, were identified as tier one. Had we not had that Spanish data, look at the misidentification we would, these children would be identified as tier two and tier three. And educators, we know this, and, and I know that you've been asking for that right assessment for that Spanish speaking students. Remember that data that I gave you earlier, that big number of 75% of those students are Spanish speaking? I want you to know that we need to be looking at the overall picture of students' literacy. And here at Amplify, we do have an assessment program called, you know, called M Class Lectura which is our Spanish assessment and universal screener. And then when, when this is used with Dibbles 8, it provides educators with a dual language report that you see here on your screen. And that report includes a side-by-side -side, um, overall literacy skills in English and in Spanish. Like for example, this, this particular report is of, of Gabriel Archuleta. So it looks at Gabriel's biliteracy journey. Remember, both of his languages are, you know, we need to assess in both of those languages in order to really be able to instruct him best. So assessing him in both languages will do that. So what you will get, that universal assessment in English and Spanish is necessary as our bilingual experts point out. So what in this report, not only will you get a side-by-side -side view of those Spanish and English skills, you will also get instructional guidance as well in order to support his biliteracy development. So this gives you a full overall literacy uh, picture of Gabriel and, and of any of those students that you will have in your classroom. So again, as our biliteracy experts pointed out in our video, universal assessment in English and Spanish is truly necessary. Spanish assessment truly informs instruction in both Spanish and English. So what a child knows in Spanish, right? So for those Spanish speaking students, such as Inez and Eli, who both have a varying degree of exposure to English, it's important to understand what those literacy skills are, the literacy skills that they have. Otherwise they're going to get the wrong instruction. So what is learned, what is learned will drive instruction in English based on transfer, which is something that a lot of you mentioned in chat when we asked that question. So, and again, let's take a look at, it's also going to guide that instruction for biliteracy for those that are in the biliteracy program, those dual language programs. For example, Marco and Tessa, who are both receiving Spanish instruction. And TESS is part of a dual language program that includes English speaker and as you know, English speakers. And as you know, that is a growing trend. So Spanish assessment is not only gonna help Marco continue in his language development in Spanish, it's gonna actually help Tessa learn it as well. So here's the bottom line, that no matter the instructional model, if the child speaks Spanish and is learning English, or receives instruction in Spanish, 
Spanish literacy assessment is essential. That's the bottom line here. So I want to leave you with this important quote from Dr. Lillian Duran, who is an associate professor at the University of Oregon and who has partnered with, with us um, here at Amplify in co-developing that M-Class Lectura a, a Spanish Assessment and Universal Screener. I want to highlight, it's important to highlight what we, we, what we have been discussing. This quote simply says, no matter what language you start to learn, foundational skills, right? There is transfer in how to listen to sounds and to put those sounds together. And eventually those sounds form words and there's meaning in those sounds and those sound combinations. And yes, sounds are important. Let me give you a personal connection and why this quote resonates with me. I can relate to it so well. Had I been assessed in both languages when I arrived in the US, Many, many years ago, my teachers would have been able to determine that I had a that I had very strong literacy skills in Spanish. Had I because I was a strong reader in my own language, but teachers never knew that because I was never assessed in my native language. I, I would have really had a very challenging time in US schools and would have not excelled had I not been a strong, had my Spanish literacy skills not been strong. But that's not the case for many emergent bilingual students, y'all. So assessing what they know in their native language is crucial to their success in acquiring that second language. And so I remember being in a classroom and that is what resonated with me as I figured out what was going around, around me is listening to those sounds and figuring out how to transfer those into my language and into the English language. But know that that does not happen automatically. So I say this to say, it's really important. This transfer piece is something that Alestra will be um, amplifying on in her part of the presentation. So I thank you for allowing me to take the time to really dive into my literacy, really talk to you about assessing students um, that are native, that are Spanish native speakers, because we have a program that does exactly that. Thank you for that, Anna. And I am going to go ahead, folks, and. Um, Kind of sort of take us take us uh kind of do a little bit of reflecting um before i do um well you see here uh, a poll and in this poll we've got a few questions the way that you can respond to these questions are true or false um, and so i'm going to give you a little bit of think time but i also while folks are working on the on the poll um I, I'd also like to just point out, I'm seeing a lot of questions are coming in the chat and I want you to know that we are, we did put some time aside for some Q and A. And so please keep those questions coming. We are gonna be talking um, uh, to you about, you know, what are your reflections and what questions that you have? So there definitely is gonna be Q and A time. Another thing I'd like to point out is, you know, um, people have asked for the slides and yes, these will be made available to you. Let us know, would it be, supportive to have these slides in Spanish, because um, that is something else that we can also provide to you. So let, let us know in the chat, you know, what, what it is that would be more supportive for you and um, the questions that you have, and we will have some time for that. Okay, so in our poll right now, the three questions, you know, what, the first question, most of the 24 sounds in Spanish have the same sounds in English, and that's letter sounds. Uh, true or false second question teachers must be bilingual to provide explicit instruction in cross-linguistic transfer we just had a conversation about that with anna and then third question the science of reading has only been validated for the teaching of reading in english true or false so go ahead and you can respond to that and we're gonna we're gonna see some results in just a moment um and then anna's gonna stop sharing and i'm gonna start sharing my screen i have you're ready okay thank you dear Okay. Yeah, and I see the questions are still coming. Thank you so much for that. So now are we going to go ahead and show the can we sh share? So let's let's take a look at these results. 
Okay, most of the 24 letter sounds in Spanish have the same sound in English. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and share the results so that we can, oh, I'm sorry, so that we can reflect on that. Um, so what you see here is, you know, interestingly, there, there, there are many of um, many of the sounds um, in the Spanish language will also be heard in in the English language. They're not always a one to one correspondence. Like if you think about the the sound of the letter H, um, you know that that sound does exist in the Spanish language, but it's represented differently. It's represented um, sometimes by G or sometimes by J or um, J or J. Uh, so. What's interesting though, is that the sounds, the letter sounds, let's think about the letters of um, the sound of the letter M or M. These have the same sound in both languages. And so as educators, we can maximize, you know, that we can also be a little, um, I'd say uh, very decisive about, you know, saving some time. We know time is the most precious, precious resource we have as educators. And if students have been introduced to that letter sound of M mm in Spanish, um, it takes less instructional time, you know, when we're doing this bridging to English because students are familiar with that sound and have mapped it onto that letter. Um, so yes, the, the, the response to number one is true. Number two, teachers have to be bilingual. Remember what Anna had shared, that dual language report. If I'm an English instructor and I have Spanish-speaking children in my class, I still can understand a little bit about the sounds of, the, of, their, of their language. I can use cross-linguistic transfer to kind of explain how things might be a little bit different. Now, does, this does require us, you know, to, to go, you know, um, a, a little bit in depth into let's learn a little bit about the language and the cultures of the students in our classes. Um, but but we can definitely find resources. Um, one I'd like to point out is if you know my languages um, .com, super helpful. I saw, you know, a lot of folks that are on this call don't only have Spanish speakers in their classroom. They have students who speak many multiple languages in a single classroom. And, you know, when I was teaching in California, I had at least six different languages um, in, in, my, in my class uh, when I taught there. So, yes, we can support cross-linguistic transfer, even if we don't speak the language um, that our students speak. We can we can do some some looking into how can I build that um, by ourselves being learners. And then the third question, the science of reading has uh, only been validated for English. And that question, that's actually false. And I, I'm so happy to see, you know, here that uh, a lot of you know that. Um, actually, if we think about this framework, and many of you will, will probably be familiar with um, Goff and Tumner's simple view of reading, but this is research that has been validated in over 150 studies across multiple languages, including Spanish. And, you know, I'd like us to sort of kind of focus here on a, a principle that we have, a science of reading principle, basically that, that you know, states Foundational skills, vocabulary, and knowledge, these are all important for reading comprehension. And these can transfer um, through explicit instruction. So kind of like us to, to sort of start there with, you know, this principle and, and that, that, you know, well-founded research, the, the simple view. Another thing I'd like us to do is let's ground ourselves in a very important biliteracy principle. So here's our expert. Um, we must honor students' home language, culture, culture, and community experiences. It's it's so key, and it's so um, it's so essential for our students to have that sense of well-being when they're in our classrooms. And it's also well documented that when children feel that the language they speak, the, the community that they come from, um, or where, you know, that culture where they feel a sense of belonging is honored in school, they're more motivated to learn, and then they can experience more success in school. And so whether students are developing their language comprehension or their word recognition skills, students should see themselves reflected positively in any curricular material. Meanwhile, we can also extend their knowledge of the world and the people in the world um, through positive representations of all people. So I'd love, you know, since this is sort of how we're going to ground ourselves, if you could just share in the chat, you know, what are some of the things that you do um, in your class, at your school, in your district to really honor students' home language and culture, be that Spanish, English, 
or any language or culture. So I'm going to go ahead and just let, let folks take a moment to share before I move us on, really looking at the science of reading with respect to biliteracy. And thank you, thank you for that. I'm seeing the I'm seeing the chat. Some some ideas are coming in. Folks are you know carefully selecting materials, um, thinking about you know traditions and holidays that that people might celebrate. Bringing in those families, you know, inviting the community to come into your classroom, um, and then connecting that to the learning that students are doing. You know, we really want to make uh, our classrooms positive spaces, even for the parents to come and feel comfortable. So I, I want to I want to really thank you uh, for sharing, um, you know, what it is that you're doing. I applaud you. You know, Anna and I are, are just so happy to see, you know, some of the things that you folks are doing really to honor the students in your class. Parent now, involvement, parent involvement seems to be a huge one that we're seeing in chat. Absolutely. And so, you know, so important. Yeah. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, the, you know, language comprehension. And we know that, you know, our students come in to our classrooms, you know, with an understanding of the language or the languages sometimes, you know, that they speak, um, thinking of multilingual learners, uh, the way that they communicate with others is really, you know, the way um, that they have been speaking and listening, um, and reading and writing in, 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 in their, their language or languages. What you see here on the screen is a representation of the kinds of topics that our students are going to see when they have reading passages in a high stakes test. And in order for our students, whatever their background, you know, whatever their language that they are they are speaking at the home, to comprehend these texts, they're going to need vocabulary. They're going to need background knowledge that are just as essential as the foundational skills required to decode them. And so our biliteracy expert here is sharing, you know, foundational skills, vocabulary and knowledge are all important. And many of you might, you know, might be familiar with this research, but let, let's consider this is a very well referenced baseball study. But I want us to think about the baseball study with respect to our students building their biliteracy. So in this study, if, if you're not familiar, um, there were four groups of students, and some students were strong readers and some were not, and some students had a deep knowledge of, of the sport baseball and others did not, and these students were asked to read a passage about baseball and answer some comprehension questions. As you might have predicted, the students who were both, you know, strong readers and knew a great deal about baseball, they performed best on that comprehension assessment. But I'd like you to just sort of make a prediction, you know, who do you think actually performed almost as well? Do you think it was the students with those strong reading skills who knew very little about baseball? Or do you think the students who had significant knowledge about baseball, but were also struggling readers would kind of be the students who performed like second best on, on this comprehension assessment? So I'll give some people some, some think time. And here are the results. So you might be surprised to learn that um, students who were knowledgeable about baseball, but they were not strong readers, they greatly outperformed the stronger readers who did not know much about baseball on that comprehension test. So let's think about the knowledge that children are building at home and in their communities. You know, here is our, as our biliteracy expert is telling us, you know, student, um, can continue, you know, developing their language at home, and this is going to really support them in building knowledge in the language of instruction. Think about a Puerto Rican student who might be talking with their grandparents about why they believe Roberto Clemente was the best baseball player of all time. Um, as educators, it's our responsibility to honor the knowledge that families and communities pass on to their children and then build upon this knowledge. And one of the ways that we can build upon this knowledge in a school setting is through oracy. Uh, oracy is, it, it's important for any student to build their knowledge. You know, it's absolutely essential for biliteracy development. So teachers and students in the class, you know, can model um, the structure of languages using vocabulary in the language of instruction. Um, if you have students who, you know, are in a dual, imagine if you're in a dual setting where you, some students are stronger in English, some students are stronger in Spanish, those students are providing models for each other. Um, and this supports language acquisition that is so necessary to access knowledge in a second language. 
Now, using collaborative structures also provide students with this opportunity to practice the language, um, you know, listening and speaking into, you know, in the language of instruction as they're starting to make those metalinguistic connections to, to any of the languages that they're speaking. Um, and then Finally, we think about flexible and dynamic grouping, right? This provides the space and the time for our students to make sense of text. Um, this also allows for students to rehearse those ideas right before they start committing them to writing. And then look at this lovely class discussion. It's an opportunity to co-construct knowledge by engaging in rich discussions with their teacher and their peers. So we would love you know, to hear from you. What are some of the collaborative structures that you're using in your classroom to really support oral language development? And you could give us really specific, you know, oh, I, I'm seeing it here. So think pair shares, restorative circles. Oh, back to back, uh, face to face. Oh, back face to face. Quote, okay, back to back face to face protocols. Um, accountable talk stems, sentence stems, all these wonderful practices, you know, that we can implement in our classrooms. Um, um, We've got lots of, you know, folks sharing out kind of in their roles, how they're doing it. We have a librarian. Um, Thank you so much for being here with us and sharing, you know, how you're supporting, um, but you'd like to start incorporating these models um, for corners. I, all of these ways of getting students, you know, not only having discussions, but also moving about, you know, really getting them engaged and activated. Um, so thank you. Writing collaboratively. I, I love it. These are some wonderful, wonderful ideas that folks are sharing here in the chat. So you know, just like our biliteracy uh, expert is telling us, I can see that folks here on the call from all of the wonderful work that you're doing out there in your classrooms and in your schools, you, we all understand oral language development is absolutely critical for all students and particularly for students building their biliteracy. So we are going to go ahead and um, I, I, I want to just sort of, you know, think about this idea that that oral language is, is a very natural process. So what we know from um, neuroscience is that the language processes occur here in, in the left hemisphere of our brain. We produce oral language, receive oral language, we make meaning of oral language just at the earliest levels of our development, you know, based on their exposure to one or, or maybe more languages. Um, but what we're not able to do without instruction is to map this language to a written code, such as the English or the Spanish code. So the way that we um, the way that we do that, um, Dr. Stanislas Dehaene is going to explain to us. Now, Dr. Stanislas Dehaene is a he's a French professor of experimental cognitive psychology, and Dr. Dehaene uses neuro um, imaging to find evidence for how reading essentially rewires our brain. Um, here's a book that he read, Reading in the Brain. Highly recommend it. Uh, it's a great read. You know, doing maybe a book study at your at your site. But I'm going to share with you a short demonstration, a video that Dr. Dehaney, you know, he kind of explains, you know, how we can, how, how does this process of reading happen in, in the human brain? Now I want to show you the activation of the brain as you read one word. We see it in time. So let me start this. Here we go. And you have the word unfolding from the back of the brain to the front of the brain. Uh, it will loop several times. You can see the information enters into the occipital pole, which is the visual side of the brain, moves into the ventral areas, and then explodes into the left hemisphere uh, distributed activity. And I love Marga. Marga shares, he's my neuro hero. <laughs> So great, great that, I, that we're able to share um, a neuro hero with everybody here on the call and thinking about, you know, with respect to biliteracy. And so what we just saw in that demonstration was real time processing of the brain of a person who has developed word recognition, automaticity um, in the visual center of their brain here in the back. You know, they've taken in information or text and they have this built network of neural connections that map onto the language center to get meaning from that text um, to build that neural network, as we can see from this model here. You know, the code, it needs to be taught explicitly and systematically. Um, 
so that we we can you know we can build this this network for students and i just kind of want to take it to you know for the students who speak spanish or are learning spanish um you know the way that we do that is um hearing and articulating the sounds of the language um you know for example if you think about the r sound of the the letter r um or or ñ from of the of the letter ñ you know what are the what are the sonidos students need to develop that phonological awareness hearing those sounds um and then then mapping those sounds to the letters in the spanish alphabet then learning to blend these letter sounds to form syllables which for those of you who are in you know in who do um provide instruction in spanish we know that we move from letters to syllables in spanish which then can then be blended to formed words um so here's an example of that in spanish early literacy instruction students are first introduced to the five vowel sounds a e i o u and then they begin learning consonants and this is a very intentional and systematic so that students can begin to blend these vowels and consonants to form syllables and then these syllables are blended to form words to build work, word recognition in spanish students need to build their automaticity with sounds and syllables to begin reading multisyllabic words um and and students do this uh, those of us who who have taught you know in spanish um we we know that students do this as early as kindergarten begin to read these multisyllabic words and then these multisyllabic words, of course, become increasingly complex as students build that repertoire of words that they can decode with automaticity, uh, like the brain that we saw in Dr. DeHaint's video. So earlier, you, we, we met Dr. Duran, um, and I, I wanted to share another really powerful quote from Dr. Duran. So here, um, if we're thinking about in terms of literacy, um, there is cross linguistic transfer. Folks were talking about this in, in the chat earlier. You know, this idea of of you know cross cross languaging or um, trans trans languaging. Lots of ways that people talk about cross linguistic cross linguistic transfer. But one one thing that is important is Dr. Dennis says there is cross linguistic transfer that happens with meta linguistic skills like phonological awareness. You know, being able to auditorily manipulate sounds and understanding sound patterns, and these skills are precursors to reading. Anna had shared she was a strong reader in her native language, and she could bridge that then to the language that she was learning English. So, if you would like to learn more about how to support cross language cross linguistic transfer in your classroom uh, we'd love to invite you to mark your calendar for november 21st with the amazing lauren burner um you're going to find a link to register to that session uh in the chat so kind of uh just want to hone in on this principle here of the science of reading that you know literacy knowledge in a second language builds from the first language and many of us here you know our students might have english as their first language our students might have spanish as their first language but we really want to leverage those those skills that students have um, as they build their biliteracy so uh, I just have a couple of, you know, sort of examples um, that I'd like to share with you, but, you know, as students are learning the code of either language, um, explicit instruction about the sounds um, that are similar and different in Spanish and English can really support them as they, they develop that, you know, building that by little, um, that multi meta linguistic awareness, sorry. Um, the teachers can be really intentional about providing time for students uh, to bridge the two languages. So think about like lessons that juxtapose the sounds or, of letters or, or letter combinations can help students develop like not only their foundational skills in both languages, but also they can gain a deeper understanding of the relationship between the two languages that they're learning. So, for example, how there are five consistent vowel sounds in Spanish, uh, e, e, o, u, but we know that there are more than five vowel sounds um, in English. But in both languages, the vowel sounds are formed by an open airway between the throat and the lips where the teeth don't make contact with the lips or tongue. That's true of both English and Spanish. So pointing out what is similar and what is different. Um, can really support students making those bilingual connections. And then as students are reading and they're learning vocabulary and context, teachers can provide explicit instruction about the words that have similar spelling and the same meaning in Spanish or English. We call these cognates. So in this example, students are working with um, tier two and tier three vocabulary. They learn that words that they encounter in an abridged version of Don Quixote de la Mancha is 
you know, entonar and confesar have English cognates, intone and confess. So as our biliteracy expert here tells us, you know, knowledge in that second language builds from the first and students can make those connections. Now, I want to kind of uh, uh, talk to you a little bit about something important to remember for us as educators. Um, we're also constantly building our own biliteracy. So like our students, you know, we educators in this biliteracy space um, are, you know, are we, we could be maybe more simultaneous bilinguals um, or maybe we are sequential bilinguals, um, but e either way, we know that language development is a lifelong process. Um, so we really want to kind of take on that, you know, mind of the learner. And, um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to share, um, Anna shared a little bit about her background, but, you know, my, my family was given sort of the advice uh, uh, at the time when I, when I was a student, um, being a simultaneous bilingual, I spoke Spanish in the home with my grandmother and I spoke English in the home with my, with my mother and father. Um, we were given sort of the, the, the advice that you know really it's 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 important that you know to focus on the english make sure you know the the student is strong that you know are strong in english because it's really going to open so many doors of opportunity um so i i was never actually uh formally educated in spanish in my k12 um if we talk about maybe high school spanish well okay then but um not not in a biliterate sort of um context so for me, and I think for all of us, you know, we have to be astute students of both Spanish and English and learning to speak a second language, as we know, it gives us a deeper understanding of our own native language or maybe our multiple <laughs> native languages if we're simultaneous bilinguals. So here's an example of an extension um, really to support teachers to do this. Um, in this expansion, in this example, you see here teachers are provided, you know, just a, a note here. Um, that students are learning about the letter sound, um, about the sound of the letter Enya, Nye, and they're learning that Enya is the only letter in the Spanish alphabet that originated in Spain. So just a little tidbit so that we're constantly kind of taking on that, that you know, mind of a learner um, as we are supporting our students also to become learners um, of, of, you know, to build their biliteracy. So what I'd like to do now before we conclude our session on leveraging the science of reading to boost by literacy is we want to share a short clip about what educators themselves like, you know, are saying about the vitality of of by literacy education. Being bilingual is like having a superpower students who are bilingual. They access more parts of their brain. They're able to think out of the box better. They can come around things a different way and they outperform their peers in high school. As educators, like we have to be on the forefront of the future. It, it is going to be absolutely vital that our students can, can operate and can work in multiple languages. It is the most important at this point, a skill that you can have to be able to function and be successful in, in this global community. We want to make sure that we match quality for quality and quantity for quantity. Whatever's available in English, we want to make sure that that's available in Spanish and we want it to be high quality. The language that our students come with, although it's different, is an asset. It is something that we can build upon. Who they are, their background, their first language, is this going to be as important as the language that they are acquiring and then the community that they are becoming part of? By allowing a dual language assessment, we can say what this student knows, what are areas of growth of this student, and how can we transfer some of those strains to that second language. How the science of reading helps, it really addresses students with learning differences in their emergent bilinguals because it's so strategic, it's so structured. It, it really is intentional about learning and each skill builds on the next. I want to first say thank you, because if you're willing to take on this journey, you are a superhero and you're going on a journey that is an incredible journey where you're going to make such a difference. Their language, their linguistic 
background and repertoire matters. So help them make those connections. We finally have a good Spanish assessment. We're definitely in a better place than we were, which is a celebration, but it can't stop there. You're intelligent, you matter, your dreams matter, and I know your teachers are doing the best that they can. The language that you speak matters um, and show that every single day. Think in English, think in Spanish, talk in English, talk in Spanish. Take every resource that you have and use it to help you be a better learner. And then when you've learned, learn some more. You're never done learning. So thank you everyone for attending our webinar today, leveraging the science of reading to boost by literacy in your school, in your district. Thank you for all of the, the um, shout outs and the hearts <laughs> um, as the video was playing, um, the applause. Um, we, we really do appreciate you being here with us. We, all, we do have five more minutes. Um, you know, we'd love to answer some questions and um, kind of share a little bit more of you know other other things for um, kind of future webinars. So um, let's go ahead and take a few questions, Anna. What do you think? One more, yes, I'd like to do that. But one thing that just came in chat that really just like stuck out to me. I love the hearts, love the thumbs up. Seems like things are resonating with folks out there, even though we can't see you. So that is a little hard for us doing this because we can't see you. So we love all of this interactive love that we're getting but one particular comment we got in chat from sarah rosa alestra i want to just throw out there and say she says yes this speaks to equity as well students need to be evaluated in both languages to see the true picture of their abilities and i think that really hits home with the entire discourse that we've had um, in this session today about leveraging that the science of reading to boost that by literacy and students. So thank you, Sarah, for kind of ending that for us and giving us something to segue into. Thank you so much for that. Okay, Laura, you're on. Thank you, ladies, so much. Um, sorry about the issue with my mic earlier. My Bluetooth headphones failed me, so I am corded right now. Uh, we've had a lot of incredible engagement, lots and lots of great questions. I know we're tight for time, so I'll go with the ones that uh, seem to come up the most. So one of them came up a lot. Um, I'll just read the first one, but they're all pretty similar. Uh, we've been discussing in our kinder team whether teaching letter names and sounds like phonics and phonemic awareness alongside, alongside English letter names and sounds is confusing for kids. Can you speak to this? I know, would you like me to take that? Yes. Okay. So, and, and we know there are lots of linguistic models out there. Um, so I've worked in schools where students are, you know, the, the let's talk about 80, 20, 90, 10, or 50, 50 models. Um, now, what, when we think about can the seeing two things side by side, our role as an educator is really to support students to understand the nuances. Um, we might want to maximize on, you know, what is similar initially. Like, for example, if I am teaching that the, we talked about the sound of the letter M or M, -E, um, how how that can be pointed out to students. But we don't want to do things without having it contextualized. So if I am going to provide instruction to my students around the letter M in English, then I'm also going to help them map that sound onto the letter. I'm also going to have decodable text for students to then be able to apply what they're learning in English and reading words. Um, you know, that have that sound. The same goes for Spanish. If if we're working on M and my students are listening and they're we're all, mm, whether they're native English or native Spanish speakers, we're practicing that sound, the same process. We're going to map that onto the letter M. This is the representation. We're going to practice writing that letter. We're going to go ahead and we're going to be doing some, um, some reading of words that have that sound um, and applying that in a decodable text. So, I think that it's that intentionality and that contextualization. You know, why are we doing this? Well, because we're 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 getting access to that code. So as long as that intention is there, as we're building those bridges, we really can eliminate the confusion. Um, as long as we're being very principled about our instruction. 
And that's Thank a good you. question because I've saw, I've seen I saw like three folks kind of ask that and it you know and I I appreciate that question because it's like are we confusing children with doing both and I think that the answer is no as as long as, as Alessandra mentioned as long as it's intentional and explicit in what we're doing there's much research now too um, as it relates to cross linguistic transfer and how important that is and so if it's intentional purposeful and explicit my answer would be, and, and it's very, like as Alessia mentioned, super intentional, it does not confuse. I you know, And I was in a classroom where there was none of this, right? But there were times that the teacher didn't even realize that they were being intentional with teaching. And so I was able to leverage all of my language repertoire in order to be able to learn English. And so learning those simultaneously in an intentional way um, actually benefits children. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I know we're out of time, so I just want to share one more bit of info and then we'll we'll close up shop here. Um, I noticed a couple of people had asked what my language website, Alestra, mentioned was. Uh, it is mylanguages.org. So the word my, the word languages.org. And we'll throw that in the chat again. And then just, just so you're aware, this webinar series is far from over. We're going to continue the conversation about biliteracy next Monday, where we're talking about cross-linguistic transfer. And then after Thanksgiving, we'll be talking about uh, professional learning. And we also have a customer panel with some of our M-Class customers coming up. That's our assessment and intervention program. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, again, as a reminder, you'll be getting an email with a link to the recording for today's session and also the presentation deck. And you'll there will also be information in there about how you can access your certificate of attendance. And thank you so, so much, Anna and Alestra and all of you for joining us today. Thanks, everyone.